Welcome to another episode of the 10 Minute Land Surveyor. I'm Dave Woolley. Today I'm going to talk about recessions and what a recession means to the land surveying industry specifically. And my experience has been as I lived through a recession in the uh, early 1990s, and I've mentioned some of the uh, things that I, I, I witnessed at that time in some other videos. Uh, of course, I was here for the uh, recession in 2007, 2008. And I started my career in this industry in the mid to late 80s. Uh, and during the 86, 87, I was working for employers and they were still talking uh, about the recession of 80, 81 and how difficult it was for their business and how, how for them to get by. And so, I, you know, I had a lot of questions. And in my experience, I uh, just my personality type is, is I've followed these things and uh, politics very closely since uh, I was about middle school age. And so I very much remember the, uh, the Carter administration and I very much remember, and of course this is from the perspective of a kid that's 12 or 13 years old. So my life experience kind of prohibited me from really understanding, but I, I remember uh, people being concerned about being laid off and the jobs. And then that was further reinforced by uh, tales from my employers in the late eighties telling me as a young man, save your money this this industry is kind of a boom and bust and and you need to you need to uh, save your money and 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 be real careful and, and live modestly and for whatever that's worth when you tell a young person but then uh i got a first-hand dose of that in the early 90s I, I lived it and i watched it come back and i saw it again in 2008 and so i want to talk about recessions uh we're due and we're in for one, but of course I'm no economist. I, I only know what I read and I don't even know that a lot of that stuff contradicts itself. But I do have some hard numbers in land surveying and what it means. So where are we as far as a recession goes? Well, if you look at uh, the Home Builders Index, which if you go DR Horton and Lennar and these home builders, they're on the New York Stock Exchange as an index. And they're, they're down as much as 30% on the year, year to date. If you want to look that up, the, uh, the, the call, the, the ticker symbol is XHB. And if you look at XHB, you'll see that uh, the index is down about 30% in May. And we've seen a little bit of a, a comeback in the market. So they may have come back a little bit, but even 20% down. So these home builders are hemorrhaging cash. There's no way around it. We've seen Target, Walmart, Amazon. These folks are down 30, 40%. And uh, just imagine if your income were to drop 30, 40%. Uh, if you look at Tesla, some of these other people, they're, they're, they're dropping more than that. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means the same to a big corporation as it means to your household budget. Without the capital, you have to scale back. And that translates to job losses. And if you're following this, you're seeing that Amazon has shed 100,000 jobs this year, uh, at least this last quarter. And what is 100,000 jobs to Amazon? Well, that's just under 10% of their U.S. working force. And I believe that 100,000 is exclusive to the U.S. They have about 1.1 million employees. 7-Eleven shed about 800 jobs. Uh, and these, these aren't jobs, these are corporate jobs. And so they're starting to cut. And they grab that middle management and they trim them out. The, uh, the boss rolls up his sleeves, the CEO down, they eliminate the middle management, they, they, they cull the, 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 the lower end of the spectrum, your people that either have less tenure or make too much money for what they de deem for that position, so on and so forth. I mean, so we, we're seeing that. Now we see uh, another one is Robinhood. I think they've lost 23%. Uh, but anyway, I could go on and on. The point is, is we're in the early stages of this. And as the Fed raises the interest rates and the cost of living goes up, uh, you know, we've all been impacted by inflation and gas prices. Uh, these cause constraints. And you don't need to be an economist to feel it and to see it. So well, again, what does that mean to the land surveying industry? Well, what I did was I was able to get a copy of the land surveying field hours for Local 3 group called CELSA. Uh, CELSA is the owners of union firms, signatory firms from Bakersfield North. And they're representative of what, what the industry does. Now they have inside the CELSA numbers, they have the people that belong to CELSA. And then they also have what they call the independents. And these are signatory firms 
that don't belong to their particular group. And they've been reporting hours back to 1972. So I'm going to go through these numbers and I'm going to show you what to expect within our industry and, and how my experience plays into this. And maybe you'll find this beneficial to either how you run your firm, the decisions you make soon, or as an employee, uh, what, what your options are, what your avenues are. Look at the screen here. What you see is this is a summary of field hours. Again, union field hours. These are going to be uh, more construction dependent than maybe some of the people who provide professional services. But you also have to put it into the context of what did land surveying look like in 1972, 1973? And uh, what was the level of effort and labor in, at that time compared to today? Uh, there's no question that we are far more productive but I think you're gonna see some pretty interesting trends here and you're gonna see some patterns here. Okay, so I wasn't around for the, the uh, recession in 1972-73, but let me tell you a little bit about it from doing some research. Uh, President Nixon was in the, in the, uh, the White House and they, they had inflation and they had costs running up and so he created uh, price controls to, to get a handle on this. And of course that didn't really work uh, he leaves office, Gerald Ford comes in for, to finish out his term, uh, inflation continues to accre increase, they have a gas crisis, and this is, uh, was gas lines and gas was not readily available, fuel for cars when I say gas, and things were spiraling out of control, uh, President Carter is elected, and it was not uncommon for you to get a mortgage in the late 70s with uh, interest as high as 16, 17, 18% uh, on, on a mortgage. So that kind of sets the table as to, to how that unraveled, but that started in 72, 73. Uh, the only bright spot was uh, President Carter had a brother, Billy, who had his own beer and Billy beer, if you were around to remember this. So let's look at what was happening in the land surveying industry specifically at this period of time. Uh, they reported, if you look here, they reported 688,000 jobs, uh, I'm sorry, 688,000 hours of land surveying. And if you figure 2,000 hours an employee, that's about close to 350 employees uh, at, at that time reporting hours inside of this CELSA group. Then you can see the recession start here. And if you look, you'll see that these are the year percentage of change from the preceding year. And I'll, I'll draw your attention here. This is a negative number. If you look at these two numbers here, uh, the numbers are going down. So if you go, you went from 688,000 hours to if you add up eight, uh, nine, seven, uh, 53, uh, you know, that's what, what 69% of the jobs were lost. 69%, imagine that, seven out of 10 field jobs vaporized in the course of three years. So that's what happened at the time at the recession. So when we were, uh, we had these peak hours up here, uh, 688,000 hours, look at this. We never saw those jobs recovered and, and back to where they were until 78, 79. Sometime in here, you hit 688,000 hours again. So that means that you lost your job in, let's say you're one of the slugs, one of the lower end people, you lost your job in 73 because you, know, you weren't the boss's son and who knows what it was. You went first round. You didn't get your job again until 78. Now. I'm in no position, and I don't think most uh, any surveyors are in a position to sit sit tight for five years hoping to get a job. And let's say you were in, let's say you you made the, this cut, and and you didn't lose your job until '75 when half of everybody lost their jobs. Well, in '75, you didn't pick your job up again in, until '77 or '78. We're saying you're one of the performers, so. Can you go two or three years without any income, and particularly a surveyor's income? Uh, you know, you look at what a surveyor makes today, and I'm, I'm going to go through a wage study that was recently released on land surveying. But land surveyors make 100 grand plus on average a year, and so 
how do you replace that income? Well, if you go to get a job for 20 bucks an hour, 2,000 hours, you're, you're, you're making uh, 40 grand a year. So you, can you live on 60% of your salary? And also you're competing with people for minimum wage jobs or barely minimum wage jobs. It's not like they're readily available. They, they, they are today in that we have 10.5 million job openings right now, but that's going to close really, really quickly. And it takes you some time, I imagine, to adjust to your reality. But let, let's go a little further and let's see what, what else we have. So you just get your job back in 79, and, and that's right here. And, and things are going great. And what happens? 8081. Now, I, I mentioned that earlier. Now, then the immortal words of Hank Williams Jr., the interest was up, the stock market was down, and you're going to get mugged if you go downtown. That's where we are today. So you just get back to running. You, uh, you start saving a little money. You, you've been working a couple years. Let's say you picked up here in 77. And then look at this. 44 and 21 for uh, 65 and 10, 75% of the surveyors, field surveyors that is, lost their job. And look at this, the span here from, from 75, so over five years, look at the job loss that you had. And you only had a good paying job for two or three years. Now I hope the people that haven't lived through a recession, I'm talking to the millennials and the Gen Zs, I hope you're paying attention because this is you, yeah, especially if you're a field only, no LSIT, I'm too busy to uh, bother with a four hour exam, I have no office skills, this is you right here. So, all right, we get back to these jobs and you'll notice that all the way down here, we're gonna skip from 80 all the way down to 95, 96. You notice we never hit 700,000 again. Matter of fact, we start going the other way. So what that means is, is that those jobs never came back. So things start picking up. We're, we're hitting on all cylinders in the survey industry. We're, we're, uh, we're up here at about 566,000 jobs. And you notice this big increase year over year. So at this point, we picked up about 45%, 46% of the jobs from the downside. However, we're nowhere near the 723,000 hours. And now this is, this is where, this is a little mini recession. Who cares? We're not even going to count that. Let's go back to, this is the one that I actually have firsthand knowledge of. 1990. 88, 89, 90, homes are going crazy. Everything's crazy. People are camping out to get a house. Interest rates for homes, if I remember correctly, 7, 8, 9%. Uh, Wall Street's banging uh, after 87 when the stock market took a, a black, whatever day that was, Friday, Monday. And then here's where it hits again. Look at this. 26 and three, go through here. This is, uh, let's see what we have. Uh, 66% job loss, hours loss. And see how it ramps up? You go 3%, 26, 25. So if you make the cut, you don't make it all the way uh, through here. Now look at these hours. Remember when I was reporting 700 earlier? Look where these are. These are, these are half those. So a lot of those people in the industry never came back. And that's, that's what I remember, that's what I experienced, that's what I lived. They were driving Budweiser trucks. Uh, they were doing whatever they could to get by, living in their parents' basement, uh, eating hot dogs. Uh, that's, that was what I, that's the way it worked out. And look at this. Look how long this negative was. One, two, three, four years. And then when it started to come back, you lost 66%. You picked up five. You picked up eight. You lost two. You're 18. So here we are. The number that I, I pointed out earlier 770,000 jobs. Now we didn't, or hours, I keep saying jobs, but I mean hours. Well, the last time we saw anything near that was 79. Took 20 years to get 79 to 99. And this was the dot-com era when the dot-com bust came along. You can do some research on that to see what happens. We have 9-11. Uh, 
we hit this little blip right here. Uh, that, that's what would attribute to these job losses of 5%, 3%. When you see 5%, 3%, that's not overall, that's year over year. So that was 8%. So almost one in 10 people lost their job over the 9-11 era. Then we're running gangbusters. And at gangbusters, I'm saying that when you get here and you look, look at this number, a million, 1.1 million man hours, uh, people hours. And you see the ramp up. Then we hit 2007. And look at this. Let me, let me just show you what happened. If you didn't live it, let me show you what happened here. Right here. This was 2007. Lehman Brothers collapses. The housing crisis uh, happens through here. And what? How many jobs did we lose? 86%. Hours translate to jobs. 86%. And so you went 66 in the 90s, which was brutal. You, had, you lost another 20%. So this gets us here. Now, go ahead and take a look. Look at these ramp ups. And this is the one that everybody, this is modern time. This is where you are today. These things slowly come up. There was a, a, a blip there in 2014. I don't know why I can't attribute that to anything, but now we get to 2018. And these, are, these stats are the same. Uh, we may have more hours, but we certainly haven't had less since then. So we're overdue. If you take four deep recessions, multi-year uh, of job losses, and then you go multi-year to get jobs back and not getting them all back, you know, you're looking at about a seven-year span from job losses to as good as it's going to get. Now, when you run a, a recessions, if you take 50 years and you divide it by four, you end up with about 12. So you have tw every 12 years, you have a deep recession and it takes seven to recover. So that means you got about five years of making hay. So what does that mean to us here now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got 19, 20, 21, eight years, eight years of making hay, eight years of plus. We are way overdue now. If we take all of these recession hours and they, they're 86%, they're 66 to 86%, the average loss of field hours in a recession, 74%. Seven and a half people lose their job out of every 10, uh, lose their hours. And so you wanna know what's gonna happen right here. When? Soon, don't know when exactly but the interest is up and the stock market's down and about seven out of 10 field people uh, are going to lose their hours, lose their jobs. And who's gonna retain their jobs? Well, that's individual, it's hard to say case by case, but overall, I'll tell you how it works. Overall, the people that are gonna maintain their jobs are the people that have multiple skill sets. Uh, I might have 20 hours in the field which generates 20 hours in the office. Well, if that's the same person, they got 40 hours, that's a work week. But if I have a, a one trick pony uh, field only, particularly because those are the folks that, uh, you know, are, are more ingrained in the construction and the development side, and they tend to lack any other skills, and they certainly tend to lack credentials, uh, particularly when you're talking about signatory people, those are the people that are gonna take it in the shorts because, uh, if I, if I have to start cutting and I have somebody that can do field work and do office work, I have one full-time position. If I have to split that in two, they can't make it, uh, the business can't make it. So you start looking as a business owner, okay, uh, we're in dire straits, it's the end of days, uh, what are we gonna do? Well, you look back and you say, no credential, no work. Uh, that's the way it goes because where's the work gonna be? It's gonna be in public works. Why? We have an infrastructure bill. I don't think that infrastructure bill is going to be here tomorrow or the next day. I don't think it's going to be a, a, a panacea for the land surveying industry, and I'll tell you why. There's a lot of uh, money in that, but it, it's going to be things that don't necessarily develop into construction. Uh, I won't go into it because this is a 10-minute video that's probably going to be a little longer than that. But what it means is, is that the infrastructure money has been marked. 
Uh, that money is going to the ports right now. The, they're able to apply for grants because they're part of the supply chain side. And so they're getting the, the first wave of it. The other money hasn't been put in the queue yet. So I'm just guessing, not knowing anything, it's a couple years out. I don't think this recession in between time is, is a couple years away. I think it's next week, next month, certainly by the middle of next year, I'm guessing. And that infrastructure money won't get down to the state, to the counties, to the cities, to the special districts in that time frame. Uh, and you got a lot of people competing for it. And you have a uh, solar panel, solar units, you know, that's green energy. And, and a lot of that's not going to translate to uh, surveying jobs and certainly not construction jobs. And here's the other thing. Every time we see one of these recessions come through, what, what happens is, is we, as an industry, and the hours prove it here, we never quite get back to where we were. And I'll give you some examples. Back in 1990, almost everybody ran a three-person crew. Uh, when things came back in 96, 97, and when they started to come back, nobody ever ran a three-person crew again outside of the agencies. But even there, they scaled back from four-people crew to three. And so we never saw that again. When they started coming back from uh, 2008, then we started seeing this one-person crew and the, oh, the technology and, you know, it, 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 it lends itself to this. And you'll hear all these nonsense stories. But the point is, is one is they didn't have the staff. Two is uh, they were running on lean budgets. Everybody was super hungry working for wages. And so they're cutting people. They don't have people. And they're running one-person crews. Back to who stays, what the owners look at is, is as an owner, uh, you look at who is upwardly mobile, who has took the time when we were busy to get their LSIT, to get their 107 drone license, who took the time to come in and draft up some corner records, learn Excel, uh, and, and, and help out, and has multiple skills, and showed a, 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 an interest more than even an aptitude in making themselves useful in other capacities. And then on the other hand, who, who couldn't be bothered coming into the office and who couldn't be bothered working when you really needed the work done? Well, there's your list. Now you look at that list and you say, uh, last, first, last hired, first fired. Okay, well, the last hired are these people who are demanding these wages. Oh, you know, I'm the best thing since buttons on a shirt, sliced bread, and I need these big checks. But also, I have to work at home. All right, well, out of sight, out of mind. Those people are gone. You know, enjoy Idaho, enjoy Arizona, wherever you are. Uh, some exceptions to that are going to be, of course, uh, big multinational firms uh, where remote working in regional people uh, they, they, they work remotely regardless of where they are because they're managing a project in Kansas. They're managing a project in Nevada. The, that upper level management's really good because wherever they are, they're remote. But if you're, if you're 26 and you think you're awesome and you're moving to Idaho and this employer, you're going to get California wages, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. That's the end of that. And because you're competing with a lot of other people and you're competing with people that frankly come in and have some water cooler talk, uh, break bread, drink coffee, and uh, no LSIT, gone. Uh, even failed LSITs are great and optimal. They'll have a little more time to study. Uh, no LS, gone. No 107, gone. QBS world of public works, which is where the only place where the money will be, Qualification-based selection means that the firm with the most qualified people is the firm that gets the work in public works. It's not a low bid situation. So if your employer can roll in and say, I have you know, five LSITs, I have three people sitting for the test, I have a person waiting for results, I have two LSs, how do you compete with that if you have people that, have, you, what are you gonna do, roll out a party chief? 10 years experience, 15 years experience, but the, the agency is going to say, yeah, but you don't even meet the minimum qualifications of our firm or, or to hire to work here, which is an LSIT. How are you going to argue you're the most qualified? You're not. That's the end of it. You're back. You're part of this list of numbers. You're that, you're that first cut.
group. So that's kind of how a recession works. That's what you can do to kind of prepare yourself is, is it's a little late on the employee side. If you're just too cool for school, can't take an LSIT, they, we need more Budweiser truck drivers and, and I'll wave when I see you. So in closing, put away your clown shoes, pack away your mini bikes and congratulations to the people that saw the, the value in studying and getting a 107, getting an LSIT during this last boom. Uh, I think you'll have, enjoy continued employment. Thank you and have a nice day.